Welcome to another video from Creative Learning Resources on how to get an A star in A level biology series. This video is specifically for CIE International AS level biology, but this could be also very helpful for IB students for preparation of the topic immunity. So let's get started. Today we're going to learn about topic 11 in the AS syllabus. It's the last topic for the AS students. This video is focusing on 11.1 which is the immune system. In order to understand the whole topic and to learn about 11.2, which is for antibodies and vaccination, please watch the next video as well. So 11.1 is about the immune system. So we're gonna talk about the effective defense of the human body against any invaders. Invaders mean any bacteria or any viruses which enter into the body. So our body immediately starts taking action and the immune system protects the body against any infectious diseases. Our immune system relies upon many functions, many chemical substances, molecules, and many steps, and there are many layers of uh, defense mechanism in which the skin plays the very important role as the first line of defense, while there are second and third lines of defenses. But the curriculum gives us direction, so we have to just focus on the mode of action of phagocytes. So we have three main types of blood cells in which a very important type is white blood cell. The white blood cells, they provide the main defense. And the white blood cells, they are mainly of two types. These two types include the phagocytes and the lymphocytes. The phagocytes can be easily identified by the specific shape of their nucleus. Their nucleus is multilobed. Also, they contain large number of small vesicles inside their cytoplasm. Sometimes they're referred as granules. That's why their cytoplasm is called as granulated cytoplasm. And these cells are called as granulated cells because they have these granules in their cytoplasm. These granules are basically lysosomes and these lysosomes contain hydrolytic enzymes. These hydrolytic enzymes play a very important role to kill the pathogens. This specific phagocyte is called as neutrophil and the neutrophils are also called as monocytes. These neutrophils are the final transformation of another type of cell which are called as monocytes. So basically the monocytes are transformed into these neutrophils once these monocytes cross the walls of the capillaries through the gaps present in the walls of the capillaries and then they are transformed into neutrophils. These cells are called as monocytes. On the other hand, lymphocytes play their own role and the lymphocytes role is to produce antibodies. These lymphocytes are actually stored in the lymph nodes. That's why they're called as lymphocytes and these lymphocytes eventually transform into two different types of cells and these are called as B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. All of the blood cells, including the B lymphocytes and the T lymphocytes, they are formed inside the bone marrow, but they are called as B lymphocytes because they develop in the bone marrow, while the T lymphocytes, they develop in the thymus gland. Thymus gland is a tiny gland which is found at the inner side of the end of the sternum or the chest bone. Now we are going to learn that what is the role of both of these type of cells during the primary immune response. The primary immune response is the immune response when the first time a pathogen enters in the body. Whenever a pathogen enters into the body, let's say a bacterium, this triggers the immune response and a nearby phagocyte will start making finger-like projections. So the presence of this bacterium will initiate the process of phagocytosis. In the process of phagocytosis, the finger-like projections are formed by a phagocyte around the bacterium and eventually the bacterium is engulfed in by enclosing it in a vesicle called as phagosome. This process of engulfing pathogen and enclosing it into a phagosome is called as phagocytosis. Eventually, the bacterium is finally inside the cytoplasm and enclosed inside a tiny vesicle called 
phagosome. The phagosome is soon surrounded by small vesicles which are called as lysosomes and these lysosomes are containing hydrolytic enzymes. Finally, the phagosome and these lysosomes, they fuse together and the enzymes inside the lysosomes, they come in a direct contact with the pathogen and the body of the pathogen is then digested by the action of these hydrolytic enzymes. This larger vesicle which is formed after the fusion of phagosome with lysosome is called as phagolysosome. The phagolysosome is eventually having the parts of the pathogen, let's say bacterium, some enzymes and the non-self antigens which are present on the surface of the pathogen. Eventually this phagolysosome touches the cell surface membrane. In the meanwhile, if the cell finds any substance useful for itself, those things they just diffuse out into the cytoplasm and used up by the cell. While the phagolysosome touches to the cell surface membrane and eventually ejecting its contents outside the cell as a debris. This debris is actually containing some very important useful substances called as non-self antigens. These non-self antigens are not just useless. These non-self antigens are going to stick to some special type of proteins present on the outer surface of this phagocyte. These proteins are called as class 2 MHC proteins. So the antigens which are released in the debris, they will stick to the class 2 MHC proteins, turning this phagocyte into an antigen presenting cell. The antigen presenting cells are the cells which contain antigens sticking to class 2 MHC protein, which is on the outer surface of a phagocyte. On the other hand, these MHC proteins could be present on the outer surface of another body cell which got infected by the same pathogen. The same pathogen is now inside another cell of our body and then they are using this cell as one of the centers of their activities. The MHC proteins can also appear on the surface of these infected body cells and some of the non-self antigens released by a phagocyte can also stick to the MHC protein called as class 1 MHC present on the outer surface of our infected body cell. So this infected cell of our body is also another type of antigen presenting cell. These are two types of antigen presenting cells which are presenting antigens and they're going to activate the specific immune response. Here we can see some monocytes and these monocytes are moving within the blood. Eventually these monocytes they are going to touch to the uh, walls of the capillaries and then eventually they are going to cross the capillary walls. They will go out of the blood vessels and then they turn into macrophages. These macrophages are attracted towards the signals coming from the infected cells. After engulfing the infected cells, these macrophages enclose them in the phagosome and eventually these phagosomes are covered with these lysosomes and these lysosomes will then fuse with the phagosome and causing the breakdown of the pathogen inside the cell. Now we are going to learn the role of lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are the type of white blood cells which play a very important role in the formation of antibodies. Lymphocytes are of two types called as B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. The role of the lymphocytes is to produce antibodies, but the difference between the function of the B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes is the B lymphocytes release their antibodies into the blood. This is called as humoral immune response. On the other hand, the T lymphocytes also produce antibodies, but they never release their antibodies and the antibodies remain attached to their outer surface. The T lymphocytes are of four types. They are called as T helper, T cytotoxic, T suppressor, and T memory. The role of the T memory and T suppressor will be discussed later during secondary immune response. The T helper cells play a very important role. And remember that these are the cells which are attacked and destroyed by HIV. So the human immunodeficiency virus, which is a virus causes a deficiency of immunity, 
that actually destroys the T helper and destroys the third line of defense also called as specific immune response. The T helper cells can stick to the antigen found next to class 2 MHC on an antigen presenting cell. We have already learned that the class 2 MHC is found at the outer surface of a phagocyte and this phagocyte is called as antigen presenting cell. The T helper cell attaches to the antigen present on the class 2 MHC with the help of its antibody or immunoglobulin. It's a globular protein gives immunity so antibodies are also called as immunoglobulin which are present on the outer surface of T helper cells. A chemical activator is then transferred from the APC into the T helper cell which start releasing a chemical signal called as cytokines. These cytokines or the chemical signals they perform two important jobs. They trigger the T cytotoxic cells and they also trigger the B lymphocytes to start undergoing a process called as clonal expansion. After activation the T cytotoxic cells which are also called as T killer cells they find an infected body cell which is having the antigens sticking to the class 1 MHC proteins on their outer surface. The cytotoxic T cell or the T killer cell binds to the antigen found next to the class 1 MHC using its antibodies. These TC cells or cytotoxic cells or the killer cells release an enzyme called as perforin. This perforin acts on the outer surface of the cell surface membrane of infected body cell which is an APC. Perforin creates very tiny holes in the cell surface membrane of the infected body cell which is an antigen presenting cell which is having a lot of pathogens bacteria which are hiding inside and using it as one of their centers of their activity. The water rushes in from high water potential to a lower water potential causing this cell to burst due to building up of a lot of osmotic pressure. This is called as cell lysis or cytolysis. On the other hand, the B lymphocytes also get activated due to the cytokines released by a T helper. These B lymphocytes start dividing by mitosis and this whole process is called as clonal expansion. Eventually, these cells divide into two groups of cells which follow completely different differentiation pathways. One of the group, they eventually turn into the cells called as the plasma cells. These plasma cells have a large number of rough endoplasmic reticula and a large number of Golgi apparatus. These cells produce and release the antibodies which are the proteins responsible for the specific immune response. These proteins are called as immunoglobulin as well because these are the globular protein which provide immunity. On the other hand, the clonal expansion results in the formation of different cells which follow different steps of differentiation during clonal expansion. This whole process of mitosis by which B lymphocytes after their activation and resulting in the formation of large number of cells, one of them are called as plasma cells and other are memory cells, they are also called as B memory. Plasma cells are responsible for the production and release of the antibodies into the blood. This is also called as humoral immune response. The human mean blood and the antibodies are released into the blood. That's why this is the humoral immune response. On the other hand, the B memory cells are responsible for the secondary immune response along with the T memory cells. Now we are going to talk about the last part of 11.1, which is 11.1.4 which is about the secondary immune response. This immune response is shown by body when a pathogen or a disease causing organism which has already attacked the body at certain point in time and then there is a second encounter by the same pathogen. The y-axis is showing the concentration of the immunoglobulin. Let's say day zero is representing the first encounter by that pathogen and the production of antibodies will take around four to five days. 
while the production rate is slow and the quantity of the antibody is not very high. At a certain point in time, when the infection is under control, the T suppressor, they suppress the memory cells to produce and release the antibodies. The concentration of the antibodies, they will start decreasing. And then if there is a second encounter by the same pathogen in the later part of the life of that human, then the T memory and the B memory cells present in the blood will start producing the antibodies at a, at a much faster rate and the concentration of the immunoglobulins will also be more than double than the first time. So when the first time on day zero, the pathogen attacked, it took around four to five days to produce the immunoglobulins. So that's how the T memory and the B memory cells play a very important role in the secondary immune response, a long-term immunity. Hope you have enjoyed the video and you have understood everything in this relatively complicated topic in order to understand 11.2 don't forget to watch next video in which i'm going to cover the whole section of 11.2 these two videos cover the whole immunity for a levels topic 11. please don't forget to subscribe the channel press the bell icon for the latest updates and drop a comment or any questions in the comment section below thanks a ton for watching hope to see you again soon